All right, I think we're on. We're going to uh, say hi. Hi. Did it pop up? I'll mess with it. You you go. You talk. I don't think anybody's on yet. There, there's one person. Scroll down. Right there. There you are. Okay. You have to turn your volume down. Sorry, just kind of trying to get our pad set up so that we can uh, uh, field questions. Um, great, so I'm going to wait until we get a bunch of people here. Uh, but in the meantime, you see we've got our stuff laid out and uh, ready to taste. Uh, for those of you that have already joined us, if you have not opened your bottle of Prosecco yet, do not open it yet. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly about how to open, why to open. Did you move away from me? I did not. Want me closer? Yes, I want you closer. Um, so, uh, the order we're going to taste the wines in tonight, uh, the Prosecco first, then the Chianti, and then the Zin last. Uh, so if you haven't opened the Prosecco, um, we're going to show you and talk a little bit about how to do that. Uh, first of all, uh, you can peel the foil off it if you haven't, um, but I'm going to talk real briefly about, uh, this device here. Uh, this is a pretty cool device. This is a cork catcher and Lorene uses it a lot. Uh, when she opens bottles of bubbly, uh, when she drinks alone, specifically when I'm not home. But this is uh, used. You actually take the uh, crown off of the bottle. This slides over the bottle, and then you screw it, and it has some sort of makeshift, really rough threads in it, and it uh, slowly pulls the cork out, and then when the cork launches, it shoots up, and it catches right in the middle here. And uh, so it's a really easy way to control... Uh, the cork and what happens to the cork. So it's it's a pretty cool device. Um, we've tried to source these for the shop and we're probably gonna try again and get some uh, because they are really, really handy and easy to use. Um, but let's talk about opening the bottle of Prosecco. Again, for those of you that just joined us, we're gonna taste the Prosecco, then the Chianti, then the Zin. And uh, I'm going to, um, oh, the sun is like glaring. I'll, go <laughs> I'll close the window. If you can't see the sunset right now, uh, that's why all of a sudden I'm like super bright and you're super blinded from my dome. But uh, the sun is just peeking out underneath the clouds and it's shining right through our kitchen window. So it's blinding is what it's doing. Oh, much better. All right. So uh, that's a lot better. Um, so we're going to open the Prosecco first. So let's talk about Prosecco while we do this and while I sort of explain how to do this. Uh, Prosecco is a region in Italy. It's in the far, located in the far, very northeast section corner of Italy, where Italy sort of the top of it sort of mushrooms out. It's in the far uh, upper right, northeast. And uh, Prosecco is the region, the style of wines that they make, pretty much exclusively sparkling. And there's a bunch of different levels of that. And this one is a, uh, if you've seen the bottle, it's a uh, Prosecco Superior. Superior is actually a uh, legally defined designation in regards to the quality and where the grapes are grown in that region. This specific region, and Superior wines, Superior uh, Proseccos, only come from two regions. Uh, Val de Biadene, which is on the label here, and uh, I know that um, you can probably take a look at your bottle. It is V-A-L-D-O-B-B-I-A-D-E-N-E. And Lorene's going to teach us how to say it. Valdo Biadene. Valdo Biadene. Valdo Biadene. I know it looks a lot like uh, Valdo Biadine. No. Valdo Biadene. Valdo Biadene. And of course, if you say it like really loud with an accent, it makes it all the much better. So, uh, hey Shane, how's it going? Um, so, when you open a bottle of sparkling, if you haven't done this already, you remove the foil. Depending on which hand you are, I'm right hand, so my right hand is stronger. I like to hold the bottle in my right hand and have my thumb on top of the cork on top of the crown. Do you want people to open with you? You can open it or you can wait. You've probably already opened it. You're probably already drunk. Most of you have probably already been drinking. The bottle of Prosecco is probably like three-fourths of the way done. The Chianti is like half done, and you've just poured your first glasses in pretty much. Hey, Eric. Um, so when you do this, the key is that you want to make sure you don't let the pressure off the top of the cork. This one's probably not 
uh, problem. But sometimes there's a lot of pressure in these bottles and it can blow the cork off. And uh, that's where you have, it's, it's in, uh, like a, uh, in law enforcement, you might refer to that as an AD, uh, an accidental discharge. Um, when the cork uh, flies out of the bottle and you were not prepared for it. Hey, Debbie, first time. Thanks. Um, so you can hold your thumb over it and then you want to twist the crown off. And if, uh, yeah, I know, Kelly. Um, if you count the number of turns on a crown, I, I cracked mine already, I broke the wire, but there's six half turns on every bottle of bubbles. I say bubbles because sparkling wine is, uh, hi Dan, thanks, welcome along. Uh, sparkling wine is the generic term, whereas if everybody calls sparkling wine champagne, that's not accurate because champagne, of course, has to come from the Champagne region of France. After you get the, the crown uh, open, without removing pressure, take your hand and grasp it so that your hand is holding the bottle and the cork, and then you want to turn the bottle and break the cork loose. The reason you do this is so that you can hold the cork really, really tight so it doesn't fly off and nothing like flies all over. Oh, bummer. You didn't chill Kelly. the sparkling. Okay. Um, and then uh, you can do this a couple ways. Hand me the little grippy thing. So, uh, Lorene, and sometimes I have to use uh, like a, this is a smoky bear, get a grip on fire prevention uh, thing you use to like open jars and cans. If you lay that over the cork, you can get a better grip. The other way, the other thing that's really handy is if you have a dish towel around or any sort of a towel, is you put that over the top of the bottle so that you can hold it. That way, if you're not strong enough just to hold the cork, the cork won't go flying and uh, um, it won't uh, go sailing away because the, the uh, towel will catch it. But otherwise, grab it, slowly turn the bottle, and you'll feel the cork start to come loose and when you open it there shouldn't be a pop there shouldn't be a lot of fizz you'll start to feel it come out you got to hold really really tight nice and just a little bit of a uh, fizz i heard a joke one time and i'm not going to repeat it here because some people might not find it that amusing about the uh the whisper that it should be so i'm going to pour this and then we're going to talk about it um, notice that just for uh, sake of discussion, I am drink drinking out of a traditional wine glass. Loreen is drinking out of a flute. So sparkling wine is traditionally served in a flute uh, or perhaps in a round goblet sort of glass. And it smells okay. And I'm going to drink out of a normal glass. So what the sort of traditional thought process is, is you can drink sparkling out of whatever glass you want. Lorene likes it out of, the go or out of a, a flute because it just is sort of pretty, it's elegant, and it is sort of the traditional thing. The other thing that you'll notice is when you pour it into a flute, oftentimes you get these streams of bubbles that come right off the bottom and they go up into the glass. And the bubbles is one of the things we're going to talk about. But if you're not familiar with it, when you see that stream that comes right out of the bottom of the glass, the reason that happens is uh, the bottom of the glass has a little etched character and there's a flaw in the bottom of the glass. So that's where the uh, CO2 can collect and stream from. So that is... They actually, at some of the wineries we've gone to, they actually have little etching tools where they etch the very bottom of the glass to create that. So... Fancy. And I'm going to drink out of a normal one. So again, this is uh, um, Nino Franco. Nino Franco is a producer. They are founded in uh, 1919 by um, uh, uh, the grandfather, actually the father of Nino Franco. And uh, now Nino Franco runs it, started running with his son, and now his son runs it with uh, the grandson of the founder. The founder was... Um, Antonio Franco, of course. Antonio. And then the son Nino, then Primo, and now Primo and his wife and Primo's daughter are running it. This wine was uh, got a lot of good points. One of the things I didn't put on the tech sheets, the, uh, 
Um, wine enthusiast rated this 94 points, and it was the number one wine enthusiast wine of the year in 2019. So it's a great bottle. Very, very nice bottle of Prosecco. Bubbles, cheers. Uh, by the way, we always um, uh, try bubbles first. Cheers. cheers. And you want to make sure you look at the person in the eye when you cheers them. Mm. So, Prosecco is an easy drinking sparkling. It's not super high acidity like champagne is. It's not super um, bready or yeasty like champagne is. And that comes from the style of the wine and the way it's made. There's several different ways to make champagne, or I'm sorry, make uh, sparkling wine. And I'm going to talk only about two of them. One is the traditional method or the uh, method champenois. And that is where you take the base wine, you put it into a bottle with some yeast and sugar, you put a crown cap on it, and it ferments in the bottle uh, like a secondary fermentation that creates the CO2 uh, and a little bit more alcohol, and that is why there's bubbles in that bottle. Then they do a disgorgement where, long story short, they uh, pop the top off and they uh, add a little bit of sugar if they're going to add sugar, and then you've got champagne where it was fermented in the actual bottle. The way Prosecco and some other sparklings in the world are made is they're made in a tank. So they do the same thing in a big tank, huge stainless steel tank. They have their still wine and they uh, add their sugar and yeast to get that second fermentation where you get the bubbles and they have a pressurized tank. And then when the wine is done, they will transport it and bottle it basically under pressure into the bottle. It's less expensive and uh, it's easier uh, and it's, um, you know, it's sort of a quote unquote mass, more mass produced sparkling wine. But that's the way Prosecco is made is in that uh, Charmat method. So if you see on the text sheet where it says type and it says Brut, that's just basically the sweetness level. And Brut is pretty much dry. And uh, that's the Charmat method. That's the tank method. Charmat is the same thing as the tank method. So what's everybody smelling and tasting in this? Apricot. Lorene says apricot. They all can hear me. Everybody else? I don't see anybody responding yet. Come on, Kelly. I know last week Ron talked about trilling and um, how you taste wine and, and trilling. You're not supposed to trill. Sparkling is a very hard habit for me. I still sort of do it, but more um, mouth it rather than trill it, because you don't want to lose all those great bubbles. And then the other thing that you don't want to do, uh, Barb says floral. floral, yes. The other thing you don't typically do with sparkling wine is swirl it, because you don't want to expand too much of the, uh, uh, you don't want to increase surface area because you're going to get too much of the bubbles evaporating. Guava, Tyler gets guava. Gardenias, Gar it's floral. Yep, floral, gardenias, right. So the other thing that uh, did you? The sheet says white flowers. White right? flowers. Think gardenia. Uh, I'm not much of a florist, uh, so somebody who knows more about flowers, white flowers. So I would think more of a uh, bright, easy um, apple, apple blossom petals. Good, Tracy. Flory, floral, mm, floral. Did you talk about um, what this wine, why it's really pretty cool? The number one? Yeah. I did. Oh, I missed that. I'm yeah, sorry, I was it. paying attention to, yeah. to, to your people. Not listening as usual. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, food pairings, wow. yes. So food pairings with uh, something light and easy like this would be uh, finger food, appetizers, light appetizers, Sparkling wine to us is really the way you start an evening. It's the way you start um, a gathering. You pour sparkling because it's easy, it's enjoyable, uh, it's refreshing. So if people come over to our home, almost universally we'll open a bottle of sparkling, whether it's California or champagne or whatever it happens to be. 
So I think pretty much anything, and uh, one of the things that is a rule, at least our rule, is it doesn't matter if uh, the experts say you should drink it or not, it's what you want to drink. So if you like it, drink it with what you want to drink it with. It's all about you. And I drink this with absolutely everything, as Ron just said. I was listening. So really just elegant, uh, easy dishes, maybe a little bit of cheese, crackers. Yep, exactly. There you go. Yep. Oh, yeah. Peach pit. I got the apricot, so. All right. So we have sparkling uh, literally three or more times a week because oh. we love it that much. Oh, the region versus the grape. Yes. The grape is Glara. Did you talk about Glara? I did not talk about Glara. So the region, uh, Prosecco is the region. And the, the grape used to actually be referred to as Prosecco, but in like 19-something, I don't remember the year, uh, they uh, renamed it, and it was Glera, G-L-E-R-A. This was rated 94 points from Wine Enthusiast, and it was uh, number one wine of the year for Wine Enthusiast in 2019. It also got 92 points from James Suckling, 91 points from uh, Wilfred Wong. If you don't know who that is, it's not that big of a deal. He's the guy that runs wine.com. And then got uh, 90 points from Wine Spirit. So very, very highly regarded wine. And, there, and you can tell it's delicious. One of the other things before we move on that I want to talk about sparkling. When you drink sparkling and you feel the, uh, the bubbles in your mouth, the carbon dioxide in your mouth, um, they refer to that as mousse. So mousse is the sort of bubbly characteristic of the carbonation. And it is rated on a scale from either like delicate to, uh, and, or light all the way up to uh, strong or aggressive. And I always refer to them as sort of uh, aggressive mousse is like drinking a Coca-Cola. You know, so if you take a, a swig of uh, carbonated soda and um, you've got just that really strong carbonation in your mouth, when you... You can just yeah, keep going. I know, I'm reading Tyler's. I know. Yeah. Uh, when you have that really aggressive carbonation from drinking carbonated soda, that would be what I consider like really aggressive. If that's exaggerated, when you drink something that tastes like liquid liquid uh, silk, uh, fine champagnes, where it is just it's the bubbles are so fine and so soft and so elegant, that is uh, to me what really fine delicate mousse is. And this one I would say is. For Prosecco, pretty fine. Yeah. Very delicate, especially for Prosecco. And, um, yeah, that's really good. I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. Anyway, so. You were so enthralled with the great taste. I was very enthralled. It's very good. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's excellent. Hopefully everybody likes it. Hi, Megan. Including those out there who uh, are not Prosecco drinkers, hopefully we converted you a little bit. So. Or sparkling drinkers in general. You should move on. Your time. All right. Well, we're going to definitely drink the rest of that bottle. This bottle probably won't, if you've got this one open, it's probably not going to last. Like, you're not going to be able to recork it. It'll be flat. So just drink it tonight. Unless you have a sealer, um, which most people don't have a sealer. But why? Just drink it. All right. All right, Barb. Like that. Next one we're going to move on to is the Chianti. So Chianti is a region in Italy. And if you've got the tech sheet, I'll talk about a couple things on the tech sheet. This is a pretty cool wine. This is the uh, Solcetto uh, Chianti. And this, the label, if you look at the label, it's uh, Solcetto is a winery. Biscaro is sort of what they call the wine. It's not entirely uh, anything other than the name. It probably has some meaning. I didn't see anything that suggested what it was. This is a, so in Chianti, in the region of Chianti, which is in Tuscany, Italy, uh, just north of Rome, um, really close to Pisa. Pisa would be sort of northwest from the Tuscan region. And there's a lot of wines in different regions within Tuscany. This is an 85% Sangiovese, 5% Caniolo, 5% Mamalo, and 5% Merlot. So Sangiovese is the grape. It's the base grape in the vast majority of wines in Tuscany, unless you're talking Super Tuscan, but especially in Chianti. 
It's generally a very uh, um, light, high acidity wine. So you can swirl this one up in your glass really well. Cool thing about Salcedo as a winery is they are uh, fully um, certified organic. They are biodynamic and they are sustainable. Uh, if you read on their website, they've just got a ton of information. Absolutely. So the question is, should you pour with an aerator? Are you talking about the, which wine? I'm guessing the Chianti is what they're talking about. Okay. Yep. Um, somebody asked if we should pour this wine with an aerator. So here's my sort of general answer to whether you use an aerator or not. It's all about personal preference. With this wine, because of how light it is, I would suggest it doesn't need to be aerated. It doesn't need to be open any more than it already is. The ultimate test for whether you want to use an aerator on wines, in my opinion, is pour yourself a glass without the aerator, put the aerator on, pour yourself a glass with the aerator. Or half a glass. Or half a glass. A, a couple of ounces. I don't know, you're drinking the whole bottle anyway. Pour it all. Um, and then taste them side by side. And when you do that, you will immediately see what the aerator does to your wine. And you can taste them side by side and see which one you like best. I have done that many, many times. And universally, I like the wine that is uh, not uh, aerated. So to me, the aeration adds almost like a, a fakey, sort of uh, fluffy um, nature character to the wine. I would much rather have the uh, wine open up slowly in the glass while I give it some air just through swirling and twirling and everything like that. Barb, you could pour two bottles. That's a great idea. So smelling this wine, taking a look at this wine. Um, sort of medium color. It's got a little bit of garnet to it. It's starting to uh, change, get a little bit darker. 17. It's so a 2017. Yes, 2017. So one of the things about organic and biodynamic, and we could talk uh, all day. Just keep going, honey. I know. He's distracting me. I Stop know. distracting me, Bart. Um, one of the things about organic and biodynamic, organic is not using any sort of uh, man-made thing. So all the fertilizer, everything is made from uh, plants or animals very much of a natural sort of uh, view of producing the wines and fertilizing. There are organic, so here's one thing. If you look at the bottle, it says made with organic grapes. They are uh, two different types of wines. There's wines that are made with organic grapes, like this one is, and there are wines that are made organically. Two different things. So I can produce, my vineyard can be completely organic, I can pick those and I can make a wine, but in the wine making, I will add some sulfites. I might do something uh, to um, correct something in the wine. And then the wine is not necessarily uh, organic, but it's made from organic grapes. If you have a wine that is made organically completely and there's no additional sulfites added, the, the life of the wine in the bottle, the shelf life of the wine before you open it, is substantially shorter than wines that have sulfite added because sulfite is a major preservative within wines and within everything else. And I know what you're asking right now is, uh, what if you get sulfite headaches? The reality is that headaches are not a symptom of a sulfite allergy. There's a Harvard research study out there, and you can probably just Google uh, Harvard sulfite study, and um, sulfites, as far as an allergy to them, exhibit more in an asthmatic characteristic rather than uh, a headache. Headaches are probably more from a uh, histamine allergy. So especially in red wines, uh, you've got more histamines from the skins and all that that's in red wine making. In fact, if you look at red wines versus white wines, white wines typically have um, more uh, sulfur, especially because it's added for a preservative and they, because they don't have the natural preservatives of uh, the skins and the tannin and all that from the red wine. And so what happens is they add a little bit more sulfur in the preservation of white wines. And so your white wines have more sulfites. And so when people say, well, I get headaches from the sulfur and the sulfites in red wines, completely false. In fact, if you eat French fries and you don't get headaches, you don't have a sulfite allergy because there's more sulfites in French fries than there are in wine. Or an orange. They always say orange. Or an orange. Or an orange. 
Uh, Melissa, yes. Um, I guess it's trendy as uh, biodynamic and everything else, but Melissa's asking if uh, not using sulfites is trendy. Yeah, I think the entire sustainability, more natural, um, and that's a whole other category of wines is natural wines. But I think sustainability, sustainability is more about the totality of the environment. So uh, energy, water preservation, uh, your sort of carbon footprint, all those things are the sustainability. Biodynamic uh, compared organic is all about, you know, um, naturally made things. Biodynamic is more about uh, planting on the uh, earth and the moon's cycles. Uh, a guy named Rudolf Steiner actually came up with the theory and he wrote the whole thing. It's called the balanced vine theory and there's a whole bunch of really interesting stuff out there. But they talk about like you uh, bury the skull of a cow in your vineyard. Um, just a balanced ecosystem. So natural predators for the 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 um, mice and other rodents in your vineyard. So that's why you see owl, owl boxes in uh, vineyards. That's a lot of biodynamic stuff. It's all cool. But this is organic. Let's taste it. But most uh, wines actually are not sulfate-free. And those that are, they don't store as well. So that's one of the issues with sulfate-free is if you have sulfate-free wine, you want to drink it a little bit sooner. And there's... And as Lorreen sort of suggested, there's really no sulfite-free wine. It's more about no sulfites added. So you might see a designation that says NSA on a, on a label. And for people who travel in Europe and they see, well, the, the bottle doesn't say it has sulfites. The only reason that is because it's an American United States labeling law that it has to say it contains sulfites. So that's why it says it on our bottles and not on theirs. So what do we smell on this one? So this is, uh, I already told you, this is a blend. It's on the tasting sheet, I believe. And it's aged in uh, 300 liter uh, American oak. The, the word they use is uh, tuneau. Uh, my uh, uh, it, Italian is not good, but that's probably a French word anyway. Um, Barb, is there a difference between, uh, in the taste? I think sulfite-free wines are generally a little bit lighter. Um, I personally, like I said, they don't, they don't seem to age as well. Um, they're not something we gravitate towards. We do carry a few of them, but they're, first of all, there aren't that many in the market. Um, but we, I have found them to be just a little lighter in general tasting. I don't know if that has to do with the sulfite or just the winemaking. It kind of all goes hand in hand. Uh, yes, Melissa, I agree. Spice and clove. Yes, very clovey, earthy, um, mineral, absolutely. So the other question about, or the other response to, and I always take it like to the next level, so I apologize. But do uh, wines contain sulfites and those with no sulfites added taste differently? Um, so if I'm making wine and I'm making it from a fabulous vineyard that cost me a lot of money to plant, to buy the land, to hire a fabulous winemaker, and we're going to make this amazing wine. And all of a sudden I say, I'm not going to add sulfites to it because I want to be natural. But I paid all this money. The shelf life isn't going to be very good. It's not going to age as long as it should in a better uh, preserved state like everybody else who's making wine from really expensive places. So everybody who has really, really expensive grapes uses sulfites and preserves their wine. So if you are making wines that don't come from that high a pedigree, you might choose to go a more natural way. But that means the fruit may not have been that great. And that's just sort of my looking beyond the curtain mentality of it, thinking about um, if I'm going to put sulfites in a wine or not. So, As we're tasting this, there was a question about how long wines uh, should can last after you open it. Personal preference, first of all. Very much personal preference. It takes me about 30 to 45 minutes to finish a bottle. Or wasn't that the question? <laughs> I suspect that wasn't the question. <laughs> no. um, uh, so how long does a bottle open? So if you open a bottle, so if you don't finish this bottle or any of the bottles other than the Prosecco tonight, put a cork on it, store it in the refrigerator. It'll probably keep for a couple of days. Um, and then just open it up. Put it in the refrigerator because it will have... Um, uh, the cold will uh, reduce the oxidation that happens from the oxygen that's in the bottle after you open it. And then just open it. Some wines will improve with age. 
uh, I'm sorry, improve over time being opened. Some of them won't. This one, as far as I'm concerned, is, uh, um, you know, an easy drinking wine. You should probably drink in the next two or three days. Diane, I don't know if it matters. Um, Diana just wants to know if um, old world wines tend to have more sulfites added. Um, or American, I'm sorry, versus old world. I don't think that that's kind of a thing. It depends on the regions in, uh, in the old world, old world being Europe that you're talking about. They will sort of tend maybe to not add quite as much sulfites. But I think in today's day and age, Winemaking is sort of, the technology of it has sort of gone all over the place and the universities are teaching it and there's just a lot, you know, it's sort of become, I won't say homogenous, but there's so much done to preserve wines that they probably have just as much. You know, as a wine drinker, I really should eat currants and figure out what they actually taste like because everybody describes wines as currenty and I don't know what that means, but thanks Barb. Yes, a little raisiny, but not quite. Uh, Debbie, yes, it would be a good steak wine, but... I think it'd be a little bit light for steak. Yeah, but maybe not the best. The Zin is probably going to be a little bit better of a steak wine. This would be... So when, once you swallow and your mouth sort of waters a little bit, that's from the acid in the wine. And uh, high acid wines pair well with high acid food. So, of course, it's... Italian, so any sort of Italian food would be the thing to pair this wine with. Yes. Pasta, exactly. And earlier uh, we had somebody say... Uh, bolognese. Bolognese, yes. Tracy, you can make bolognese for us uh, when we have our tasting here at the house. How's that? Um, so Italian food. A really uh, interesting way to think about food pairing is, especially if you have wines from a specific region in the old world, so Spanish wines, Portuguese wines, Italian wines, French wines. Look at the the uh, culinary characteristics of the food and what they traditionally eat in that region where the wine comes from. That's going to be the natural pairing because this is like evolution. It's like survival of the fittest. If if uh, you've got pizza and uh, you uh, you have wines that don't go well with pizza, those wines aren't going to last. So that's like... Uh, Darwin, that's like wine Darwin right there. So we do have somebody who wants to uh, know how you properly taste. And I'm thinking that may be a good time to explain that maybe briefly, but maybe at a next one to go into a little bit more depth. But a good time to explain how briefly to taste would be as we move into the Zin. And then next week, by the way, we've already got the wines picked for next week. Uh, you can start the entire... It's supposed to be a half an hour, but it looks like it's going to be more like 45 minutes as uh, on how to taste. So she thinks it's supposed to be a half an hour, but it's going to be more like an hour. So, um, All right. So there's a little grippy tan into that wine. As an organic wine, organic wine sometimes they don't maybe present as, as full and as rich. This is really nice. It's got good acid. It's got a little grippy tannin. So it actually it only says organic some grapes. Clothing. Right. Okay. All right. Made with organic grapes, not an organic wine. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yep. And we talked about that. Because that is, yeah, but I understand. But anyway. Let's Thanks. see if there's anything else we're going to talk about here. I can just leave. No, please don't. Um, no, I think I got it all. All right. So. On to the next wine. Is everybody ready to go on to the next wine? Yes, I am ready. I agree. Everyone agrees with you, Ron. What else is going on? What else is going on? I mean, you can keep talking because okay. what else is going on. So, All right. Shay. Perfect. I might just go to the cellar Thanks, and grab Amanda. another bottle. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should be uh, flattered or offended. <laughs> By uh, what this is By the best thing meant. going on yeah. today. Well, it's because there's really probably not a lot going on. Yeah. So, if life were normal, I'd be talking to myself, which <laughs> I do a lot anyway. So, yes, whatever. All right. So, uh, last wine of uh, the official tasting is uh, from California, and this is a Zinfandel. So, this is from a winery. 
uh, called Terra Rouge. So Terra Rouge is sort of the estate, and they produce two labels. They produce uh, Terra Rouge label, and then they produce wines under the Easton label. And uh, the Easton label is Bill Easton. So this is the wine, which you already have in front of you. This is from Amador County. Amador County in California is pretty far inland. So if you are, uh, uh, if you know where Napa Valley is and, and sort of San Francisco Bay, you've got Sacramento that is north and east of the uh, San Francisco Bay area. And then you've got Amador County, which is further east and a little bit south. It's in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, and the, uh, the vineyards are at a little bit elevation. Not super high, but they're a little bit elevation. Zinfandel is the grape, and most people uh, know or believe that Zinfandel is sort of an American grape. It's, you know, you don't see, well, actually, we have seen wines from some other places named or identify as Zinfandel. No. So, like, Australia or something weird. Australia is identifying as Zinfandel. Zinfandel, which is totally weird. But uh, Zinfandel is a grape is what sort of we call it. And for the longest time, everybody thought that it was, uh, what does Melissa Don't say? Don't worry Boulevard. about it. I can't help it. Just, you just keep, I'm. I'm keeping talking. Um, so Zinfandel, everybody thought that it was just sort of an American grape. But through the miracle of uh, DNA um, testing, they found that it was the same grape, DNA-wise, as a grape called Primitivo from Italy. So Primitivo is an Italian grape varietal grown in the heel, down in Puglia, which is in the heel of the boot of Italy. Uh, through additional DNA testing, they figured out that Primitivo and or Zin, the same grape, was uh, um, the apparent to a grape called Plavak Mali, which is a uh, um, Serbian grape. Croatian grape, not Serbia. Croatian grape. Sorry. What's that? I was just... Processing what no, you're saying. Croatian grape. Drink some more. I will. Trust me, I will. Um, Don't worry. Uh, so then they figured out that the uh, parent of the grape was, and I don't know how to pronounce it, Serzanik Kostolansky. So that's the uh, the same grape as I'm sorry. That's the same grape as Zin and Primitivos, C R L J E N A K K A S T E L A N S K I, Serjanic Kostolansky from Croatia. So there are uh, a bunch of different grapes named this, but in the U S. we call it Zin, and it's produced very differently than if you have a Primitivo uh, from Italy. Zinfandel is typically a very big, powerful, high alcohol, um, pretty extracted wine. Amador County is a pretty warm region, uh, quite warm being in inland, uh, although not super hot. So if you're familiar with Napa Valley, and a lot of people are familiar with Napa Valley, Calistoga is at the furthest uh, northern portion of Napa Valley. Uh, Healdsburg is uh, that's in Sonoma. And then um, just south of Calistoga, it escapes me. But it, in temperature-wise, Amador County and where this is made is not as hal uh, hot as Calistoga, but it's about the same as uh, Healdsburg or some other sort of mid-regions within uh, Napa. So what do we smell on this? Blackberry. I also taste it. I'm sorry, did I skip ahead? No, nope. blackberry. blackberry. Mm -hmm. Like or black raspberry. I think that's such a thing. Black raspberry. Super dark fruit on the nose. So this one has. Uh, so I like Zins. Lorene loves Zin. Well, I used to love them more, but now they're, they're often, as Barb commented, they're often really heavy and thick for me. This one is not does not reach that heavy and thick court. This is a little bit more elegant. Is that going to happen to me? <laughs> <laughs> you can control that. Whether you love me or not? <laughs> you used to love Zinn, now you don't love it as much? <laughs> anyway. Um, 
what I like about Zins, in the Zins that I like, uh, they are big, powerful, but they're not just fruit bombs. And they have what I refer to as bramble. So when I was a kid, I would go pick raspberries on uh, um, sort of my grandmother's uh, house and farm up in uh, Hurley. And uh, in Hurley, when I'd walk through the raspberry patch and you'd get the little, uh, all the thorny and uh, sort of bramble characteristics of the raspberries, and you'd smell the fruit and you'd be eating the fruit and you'd be smelling the green of the, of the raspberry patch. To me, that's what bramble is. And bramble to me is now an aroma that reminds me of that, that from my childhood. And so I get that sort of green, uh, juicy, a little stemmy. Do you get stemmy in this? Stemmy, but in a bramble sort of way, like in a oh, good, okay. in a good, a good not way, in a green not way. in a green way. No. So we've carried this wine in the past. We haven't had it in a few years. We just brought it in actually, um, just last week, mm. and um, I forgot how good it is. It's still Zin. I love my Zin, but it. Um, it just adds a touch of class. There's a little bit, it's just not big fruit, almost sweet, which of course it's not sweet because there's no uh, sugars usually in Zin, but that impression of sweetness, this doesn't have that. This is just yummy. It's really good. That's right. It's really good. Yeah. I agree. And, um, hmm. Debbie, that's what I was just talking about. Dryer. Um, dry is actually, a, um, kind of what I was referring to, but not quite. But I think that you and I are on the same page. So uh, Kelly says she wouldn't guess this as Zin. And uh, I think one of the things with Zin on the market is that a lot of it is like overblown fruit. Like two big fruity characteristics and not enough of complexity and depth and breadth and uh, character to the wine. And this one has that depth. And it's not just a fruit bomb, which is why I really love it. And it's not a peppery zin, absolutely. One of the things that Ron and I were talking about right before we started the tasting is that um, kind of planning future tastings, what we're going to try to do is pick a region. And Ron was like, well, we're doing Italy tonight. And um, we aren't really doing Italy because, of course, this is California. But as he talked about earlier, uh, Primitivo is what they call zin. Um, in Italy, same same DNA as, as Zen Primitivo. So we are kind of doing um, Italy. I think this drinks more like an old world Zen, um, which I think are often a little more elegant, not so fruit forward, not so big and bold. Not, if any of you were on last week, no mega purple added. Um, I think that this is uh, more perhaps uh, traditional Zen versus what California developed into being, which, by the way, I love. I'm not saying anything bad about it. Um, so I think this is what Zen should be. A little more rustic, not overblown, not overdone. Uh, but this is still not Primitivo. Primitivo would present much lighter and softer. And that's just based on uh, climate, really, is what it is. Um, quick note about how to taste. Next week, you will go through the whole seven or your all your S's, but maybe today you can speed taste. All right. Like, seriously, speed taste. you got two minutes. I think it's up to them how long I have. They can turn you off. They can, and I could just sit here for the rest of the night and drink <laughs> in front of the camera. All right, speed tasting. Uh, so it's all about uh, the S's, and it's all about your senses. So you want to uh, see it, swirl it, smell it, sip it, Slurp it, swallow it, and savor it. Got that? So, first thing is I want to look at the wine. Hold over something light colored. Look at the color, the clarity, the depth, uh, the hue, the tones, all of those things. Next thing you're going to do is swirl it. When you swirl it, it's evaporating. Aromas collect in the glass. Next thing you're going to do is smell it. Smell at the bottom of the glass, the top of the glass, all around the opening of the glass. And just continue to smell it. And smell it, and smell it, and smell it. Um, and after you smell it, you want to sip it. Take enough of the wine into your mouth where you're comfortable holding it, but uh, you have enough where you kind of like, 
mouthwash it, not quite as aggressive as mouthwash it, but kind of move it around your mouth, you can coat your entire palate. While you still have the wine in your mouth, you want to slurp it. So this is, with the wine in your mouth, tip your head slightly forward and draw air through your pursed lips as though you're slurping soup off of a spoon. So you draw air across the wine, goes up in your retro nasal passages, you engage your sense of smell with your uh, sense of taste. After that, you want to swallow it. When you swallow it, you want to think about what happens in your mouth right after you swallow. So does your mouth dry out? Does your mouth water? Um, and then after that, you want to figure out how long it, it lasts. So you want to savor it. Savoring it is all about thinking about what's left, how long those flavors linger, what's going on in your mouth and your nose, sort of breathe in and out. And uh, People um, are asking the name of the Zin. I just want to remind people. It's the Easton from Amador County, California. Thank you. Good. A couple of people asked. So the good news, that means that not everybody um, has joined us yet for the tasting, so we're hopefully going to convert you, and next week you'll join us. So next week we're tasting a... Did uh, you get through? The, or what, you wanted to? Did I, before I was so rudely interrupted? No, nothing rude about it, honey. Okay. Okay. Good. Go. Um, this is really good. So you've had three. Oh, so uh, just as a little introduction, a little bit more about Terre Rouge and Easton. Terre Rouge wines are focused on Rhone varietals. So Syrah, Grenache, Morvedra, the white Rhones. The Easton label are grapes other than the Rhone varietals. So Terre Rouge is the winery. Under the Terre Rouge label, they do all Rhone uh, varietals. You know, great, great varieties. Not actually from Rhone, but from California. And then the Easton label are all grapes other than those Rhone varietals. We have people asking about next week. Yes, I can show the other bottles up close. So we started with the uh, Rustico. Prosecco from Valdebiadene. Then we went to the Salcedo Chiante. I think we only have one of them in there. Yeah, you're right. I was just checking. You can bring that one out. And then this was the Easton. Oh, you saw the Easton. Sarah, it's only Monday. That doesn't count. So next week, we're going to taste a uh, uh, really, really, what I think is a really cool white wine. Chances are you've never had one. It's a pick pool. Pick pool Unless you're part of our wine club, our uh, Western Wine Club. Wine. Actually, I think at one point the Wasa did too. We've had the pick pool one because it is, it's, a, it's a great wine. Love it. Pick pool de Pinay from uh, France. Then we're going to taste a Starmont Merlot, which is a big, powerful uh, Carneros from Napa Merlot. And then we're going to taste this one, and this is the Bellicosa uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's next week's, and I'll put those out on the, on the Facebook page so you guys can uh, see them. And we'll probably start selling them right away, um, maybe even tomorrow. I think we've got them all in the shop, so we'll probably uh, put it together. Um, one of the things we talked about before we started the tasting was if we uh, put it out to you guys, what would you like us to taste? What do we want what options do we want to give? Not next week. Next week's already. Oh, yeah, picked. next week after. Yeah. Um, Spain, Ryan wants to do Spain. So, I think all bubbles, but you know, I, I know all of you when I'll be into that, but I would do a whole entire bubble tasting. And the other thing you can say is uh, is three wines a good, is three wines enough? <laughs> I mean, oh, good. Oh, somebody says Thanks Spain. I like Spain. Yes, I like Spain. Um, I, I mean, for some of us, three wines is enough. For uh, some of us, three wines isn't even nearly enough. So, Crystal, this was Italy. This so, is, we this already beat of, you to it. This is I, kind of Italy. This is of. Prosecco, Chianti, and then Zin, but we could have had a uh, Primitivo if we were really doing Italy, but. 
Diane, I like what you're thinking. Diane is saying we should always do it at home. <laughs> but you know, we're missing you guys. We seriously are missing seeing you and uh, the interaction. Um, but thank you for joining us. And all the questions and everything, we've really appreciated it. Um, the wine is what's keeping us open right now. So please keep coming in and keep buying wine and buy a sandwich too. That's good for you. <laughs> Not just all alcohol. And uh, a couple other things because we got to still plug the shop a little bit. Uh, we do have our take and bake pizzas. Uh, take and bake pizza with the Chianti would have been awesome. Um, <laughs> really, Jesse? We, uh, I didn't miss what he said. He said three is enough. There's only two of them. You can keep them. Um, did you did you finish uh, responding to how long a wine can stay in the refrigerator? Yeah, a few days. Personally, um, I think it's personal. Some people will try a wine today, and then in three weeks, they don't notice the difference. Other people, me in particular, and maybe wine snobs, I think I'm a little bit, or geeks, wine geeks, we would notice that it's, it's perhaps oxidized. But if it doesn't matter to you, if you like the way it tastes and it tastes the same, you can keep the wine a week, two weeks, three weeks. I personally think, without sealing it up appropriately, I know, that um, inappropriately would be like we do at the shop. We have a, a home system here that is the same thing we use at the shop. Um, I would think only two or three days you'd want to keep it. Whites, I believe, stay longer, not bubbles. But whites stay longer. I think you can do um, four or five days on a white. So tonight, Jesse, you don't have to drink all three of them. Uh, you can keep these two for, t for tomorrow night. If you want to schedule, drink the, drink the Prosecco tonight. Drink the Chianti tomorrow night. Drink the Zin on Wednesday night. The Zin will stay longer because it's bigger, more powerful, more, more tannin. More alcohol. More alcohol, higher alcohol. Exactly. All right. And... Um, also, our wine club, if you're not a member of the wine club, uh, the wine club right now is $25 a month. At the end of March, well, tomorrow's the end of March. Today's the end of March. No, tomorrow's. Tomorrow's the end of March. It's going to go up to $30 a month. But if anybody wants to join annually, uh, they can join at the $25 a month through April, correct? If they um, join annually? Yes. Yeah. So if you we join... extended it because of, of our situation. Right. Uh, so it's like a COVID wine special. Uh, so if you want to join annually, it's $275. You get one month free. And uh, that's for a year. You can do that uh, through the end of April. And then um, otherwise it's going to go up to, on a monthly basis, it's going to go up to $30 a month for our monthly members. What does the wine club include? The wine club includes Good question. Uh, two bottles of wine, typically a featured red and a featured white, although we have some customers who do all red and a few customers who do all white. With the wine club, you get the two wines, whether it's the two featured or the featured red and um, alternate red or whatever it is. You get a newsletter, and uh, the newsletter talks about each of the wines, and then there's usually a coupon uh, for... Yes, we'll talk about the art. Um, then the, the wine club is, there's a uh, um, typically a special, like a buy one, get one. Our wine club members also get early access to our annual wine sales, which just, uh, I put it out there before, but our wine sale uh, this month, uh, or April, is supposed to be next weekend or this coming weekend. We had to cancel the wine sale because of all the things going on. We didn't want to have a bunch of people in the shops. So I apologize, but uh, we will reschedule the wine sale, and um, we will uh, definitely uh, get that out there when the sale uh, comes about. So the wine club is just a really cool way. The wines are from all over the world. That's uh, not just like one region or one wine. The value of the wines, you know, was always greater than twenty-five dollars. The value of the wines now are always going to be greater than thirty dollars. It's just a great way to get two bottles of wine in your hands. Uh, each month that represent for the region, the style from all over the place. And um, it's just a really, really uh, cool thing to do. Um, the other thing, and this is for uh, new or current wine club members, if you're not familiar, is we have the Kicker Club. And the Kicker Club is an add-on to our normal wine club. It's $35 a month. And the $35 goes to one additional bottle. That's always valued at greater than $35, and it's one additional bottle a month. And the sort of the mentality, the, the way that we sort of came up with this thought is that everybody deserves one great bottle of wine a month. 
And the uh, the lines, I mean, we had some like, we had a $90 pre-rot featured in the Kicker Club. And that was, a, you know, $35 that you pay and you get this $90 bottle. Routinely, we have bottles that are $40 to $60 a bottle in the uh, Kicker Club. It's a great, great value, incredible value. And right now, why not? You should not hold your wines for the, the, the right time because the right time is right now. Because who else do you want to spend your time with than who you're sitting next to right now? Nobody, honey. Yes. Except all of them, maybe. All a little of you bit. Guys too. So. <laughs> um, oh, the, the print on the back. So uh, that is a uh, print called the Martini. You can't see the whole thing. Um, but I'll if let you. you see it. What's that? I'll show them. Oh, you're going to move the camera around? All right. We're going rogue. Totally off script. No, don't do that. Yeah, there you go. Did I get it? Yep. So that print is, uh, uh, it's a print called Mar the Martini. You can just leave it like that. It's fine. Okay. okay. And uh, that is, uh, the artist is Thomas Arvid. Uh, so Thomas Arvid is actually an artist that uh, we have. If you've been into our Wausau store, the big um, bottle of the, of the Kenwright Pinot and a couple other Pinots, that's a Thomas Arvid print as well. Um, Lorene and I have uh, uh, a great story about uh, Thomas Arvid. We have a fetish for Thomas Arvid's stuff. Up a little bit. There there, there's another one. And I'm going to keep going. We have 14 of them in the house. There's Ron's most uh, important one right there. That's not the most important one. So the most important one, so curiously and... Uh, one of the people viewing tonight, um, Mark and Barb. Mark and Barb have been customers of ours for a very, very long time. And I just told the story the other day to some of our employees. Um, so I met uh, Barb one night many, many years ago, probably in 2002. We were at uh, Wine, Cheese, and All That Jazz before it became um, what it became. And... Uh, we were uh, there, and there was uh, some silent auction items. And one of them, actually two of them, were Thomas Arvid prints. Because there used to be an art studio in town that carried Thomas Arvid prints. And Barbara and I are standing next to each other. It's a silent auction. And uh, we were both bidding on these. And I'd bid on them, and then she'd bid on them both. Then I'd bid on them both, and she'd bid on them both. We were just driving the price up. And we were the only ones bidding on them. So I looked at Barbara and I said, okay, I tell you what. Why don't you just choose the one that you want, you can buy that one. I'll bid on the other one, and I'll buy that one. And we just basically made a decision that we weren't gonna just drive the price up. We both would go home with an Arvid print, and that's what we would do. And uh, lo and behold, that's what happened. And we've got uh, the one that we bought that night. And then Mark and Barb became wine club members of ours. And then uh, if, um, uh, this is just, just the way it ties in. We've had some fabulous, amazing customers. Many of you are. Um, so they become wine uh, customers of ours and wine club members. And we have a Name the Wine Club newsletter contest. And uh, Mark and Barb named our newsletter. So for all of the wine club members out there, the New Cork Times was named by Mark and Barb. So... Super like long time callback. When did we start the wine club in two thousand seven? Seven something. Something. Yeah. And uh, they named our wine club newsletter. So, um, but that's Thomas Arvid. We are a Thomas Arvid gallery at the shop. We can order the prints if you are interested in any of the prints. If you go to thomasarvid.com, we've met Thomas and his uh, wife Vanessa. We went down to Georgia and met him in a studio and bought that big print that Lorraine showed you. And uh, um, we can order the prints. And right now, actually, um, at least through the end of March, and maybe I can email Vanessa and uh, um, get her to extend this. But if you went on to thomasarvard.com and you bought a, a wine print from them, you can name us as your preferred studio, and they will uh, pass along 50% of the proceeds to Vino Latte, which would be awesome. So if you want to buy some wine art... And, you know, if it weren't for wine art, uh, we would have no art at all because I like ducks and, like, deer and wildlife prints. And Lorene likes... Flowers. Flowers. Like flowers. No. So it's wine. So we have a whole bunch of them. So on that note, it is 8 o'clock. Thank you all for supporting us. 
We will make it through. You will make it through. And we'll see you next week. Or in the shops. Yes, absolutely in the shops. We will see you next week. Let us know um, what we're doing two weeks from now. We've already got next week's picked out. If we should do Spain. If we should do Italy. We already did Italy. If we should do all Pinots, which I don't want to do, but I love Pinot. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Down on the bottom.